seated. We will start our celebration. 10 years, let's start with an applause. First of all, we can't begin this wonderful celebration without thanking our sponsors. There are so many people in this room and around the table that have actually been at the promise level. Andrew Brown Drugstore has been with us for all 10 years. Yoder Insurance, new to the area, but the last two years they have actually been at the promise level. New story for their continued support. And above all, Penusca College of Professional Studies. The faculty, staff, and students have been outstanding. Before I start with introducing, last night at dinner, Patricia and Ed Leahy welcomed us with their company. And Patricia made a statement that really, when I went home last night, I couldn't fall asleep because it really hit home. And she said, it's by the grace of God that something doesn't happen. And we have to realize how very fortunate we are. So it made me think of my favorite poem. Last year I read uh, Keats, but this year it was Sometimes by David uh, Budbill. Sometimes when day after day we have cloudless blue skies, warm temperatures, colorful trees, and brilliant sun, when it seems like all this will go on forever, when I harvest vegetables from the garden all day, then drink tea and doze in the late afternoon sun, and in the evening one night make pickled beets and green tomato chutney, the next red tomato chutney, and the day after that pick the fruits of my arbor and make great jam. When we walk in the woods every evening over fallen leaves through yellow light, when nights are cool and days warm, when I am so happy, I'm afraid I might explode or disappear or somehow be taken away from all of this. At those times when I feel so happy, so good, so alive, so in love with the world, with my own sensuous, beautiful life, suddenly I think about all the suffering and pain in the world the agony and dying. I think about all those people being tortured right now in my name. But I still feel happy and good, alive in love with the world and with my lucky, guilty, sensuous, beautiful life because I know in the next minute or tomorrow all this may be taken from me. And therefore, I've got to say right now what I feel and know and see. I've got to say right now how beautiful and sweet this world can be. I look out, I see all of you. I see Rebecca, I see Lori, I see Pat, Diane, endless people that just make me feel how lucky I am to be alive and how you, you make the difference. And I thank each and every one of you. With that, <laughs> with that, I would like to introduce one of our graduate students from the Panuska College of Professional Studies from the counseling, community counseling graduate program, Miss Heather Stewart. <laughs> Thank you.
like the dark, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The colors of the rainbow, so pretty in the sky, are also on the faces of people passing by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? They're really saying, I, I love you. I hear babies cry and I watch them grow. They'll learn much more than we'll ever know. And I think to myself, what a wonderful My breath away. Heather, good luck at work and studies, and thank you very, very much. One more round of applause, please. <laughs> well, as the Dean of the Penusca College of Professional Studies, it is my honor to introduce to you, to the first time in the 10 years of this Disabilities Conference, our very own president, the Reverend Father Kevin P. Quinn, who had his inauguration a few weeks ago, joined us July 1. This is his first conference, and I hope he's here for another 10, when we don't have any more problems with the dis and only see the ability. I give you our very Reverend. Good morning. I feel I've already been upstaged by Heather here, so maybe I'll just sit down, but I'll just speak for a very few minutes. My friends, today we commemorate a decade of dialogue on disabilities, and we celebrate your many accomplishments. As you know, this conference is about the transition of young people with disabilities from school to adult life. Concern about the welfare of others especially those marginalized by society, drives much in Jesuit education. As part of our Catholic and Jesuit faith response to the suffering of others, we urge our students to use their gifts and talents to make a difference in the world. In the spirit of St. Ignatius of Loyola, founder of the Jesuit order, may all of us at this conference today feel empowered to continue making a difference in our world. Ed and Patricia Leahy are honorary conference chairpersons for the last 10 years have certainly made a difference. From unconditional love for their own son who left our world much too early to ongoing advocacy for many young people with disabilities, they model what we celebrate at the University of Scranton, a faith that does justice. Likewise, our chairpersons, Dr. Lori Brooke, 
Dr. Rebecca Dalgan and Mrs. Valerie Clark, with their committee members, have labored mightily over the past year to organize this conference that celebrates the God-given abilities of everyone in our global community. Very ably led by Dean Deb Pellegrino of our Penusca College of Professional Studies, appropriately hosts this conference on campus because its mission, the mission of Penusca College, encourages learning, educates the whole person, and promotes the service of faith and the promotion of justice. We look forward to hearing from our noted na national experts today, including the Honorable Lene M. Rutledge, Commissioner of Rehabilitation Services Administration, Office of Special Education and Rehabilitation Services, U.S. Department of Education. Kathleen West Evans, Director of Business Relations for the National Council of State Administrators in Vocational Rehabilitation. David Dinotaris, Director of Pennsylvania Bureau of Blindness and Visual Services. And Dale DeLeo, author, consultant, and well-known advocate for people with disabilities. As the new president of the University of Scranton, I feel privileged to welcome you to campus and to acknowledge your decade-long record of assisting people with disabilities. Enjoy your day at our university and our city. Thank you. When I think about sometimes, look at our new president. Thank you very much, Quinn. Now it is my honor to introduce to you our two gifts, our honorary chairpersons, Patricia and Edward Leahy. You've never been shy. <laughs> I only do what I'm told to do. That's not true. <laughs> Thank you all so very much for being with us today. Father Quinn, it is really an honor to have you here for our 10th anniversary of the Disability Conference. It is really a pleasure. We had a wonderful time with you last night. Um, and I want you to know how meaningful it is to us to have you as our president at the University of Scranton. It's a wonderful institution from um, which my husband graduated. And um, I do want to say one thing about Scranton. You have some of the nicest people I have ever met in my life. You are a caring community. You are a wonderful community. And although I went to Boston College, I do want you to know that the University of Scranton is as close to my heart. And I do want you to know that. Um, Ed and I, Ed, please join me uh, because we, because you're not shy, and we want to thank so many people. Obviously, it starts with Father Quinn, Dean Deborah. Please, a few words about Dean Deborah. I could, I could go on forever about Dean Deborah. The dean's been a um, an amazing force of vitality here at the at the college, and has done a uh, terrific job with this conference. I'm just so impressed. As I look over here and see these uh, banners from nine conferences past, it's hard to believe that this is the tenth conference that we've um, that we've been involved with. But it's gone very well. We've had uh, great crowds, and I think actually we've most importantly we've done some good. I think that uh, in keeping the issue of individuals with disabilities in the forefront, every opportunity we can, I think that helps that that helps the the community. I think it helps this community. Uh, of Scranton, and I think it helps the university, and I think it helps the individuals with disabilities. So um, I'm very impressed with what the dean's done, and I'm just very impressed with, frankly, what the university has done with this conference and with the center and with the um, Health and Family Center and with the medical clinic. So um, I just want to, I, I have very little to say other than thank you all. It's been um, a terrific experience, and um, we hope to see it go on and on and on. So. And Ed, I know you join me in, in thanking, um, obviously, Dean Deborah. It doesn't happen without Dean Deborah Pellegrino. And the co-chairs, Dr. Lori Burke, Dr. Rebecca Dolgan, and Dr. Valerie Clark. Thank you, 
thank you so much. There are others as well. There are so many others. Uh, Ray Schwenk, Fran Mancuso, Meg Hambrose. I'm leaving at least three or four people out. I run a legislative summit. I know how much work goes into a conference. I know how hard the individuals here work on this conference. And from the bottom of our hearts, we want to thank you. You do a fabulous job. You make us proud. You make individuals with disabilities proud. Thank you very much. I will now have Patricia Leahy come up to introduce our keynote speaker. I also have the pleasure of introducing two terrific people. Um, the first is Kathy West Evans. Kathy West Evans is founder and director of the National Employment Team, the NET, N-E-T, National Employment Team. And Kathy West Evans, as you probably know, is with CSAVR, Council of State Administrators of Vocational Rehabilitation. There are 80 of them throughout the country. I first met Kathy West Evans in RSA, the Rehabilitation Services Administration. I was the political person uh, in the Clinton administration, and um, I think you came on board perhaps a year after, and I recognized her talent right away. First of all, she spoke her mind. I really like that. I think most people like forthright people, and that doesn't happen that often in Washington. It's a di diplomatic town. Diplomacy is the rule of the day. Kathy West Evans uh, was always professional in her, in her comments, and she taught me a lot. Uh, so it is a pleasure to have you with us. And Kathy was out there courting employers before anybody else, as far as I'm concerned. Um, she's been doing it for over 15 years. She's been doing it very, very successfully. And my husband, Ed Leahy, knows Kathy as well on several levels. but. Kathy and I usually talk about 8 p.m. Eastern time. Kathy is from Washington State, and it is the most convenient time, certainly for you to talk, because you're always on conference calls with employers like Beth Butler of Lowe's. <laughs> now, Beth, Beth Butler is also a very good friend, and I do want you to know that Beth Butler has testified before the U.S. Congress at least once and perhaps more than once and was extremely, extremely well received. Beth told her story, and her story is impressive, as is Beth Butler. Beth, um, uh, let's see, I think a couple of years back, was with Wachovia, which is now Wells Fargo. And uh, Beth is head of diversity and inclusion at uh, Lowe's, which I happen to, I love Lowe's. Lowe's is uh, my hardware store of choice. And I love hardware stores. Ed Leahy does not, but I do. I can be, I will be in there with a cart. He will not push that cart, but I'll push it. I'll push that cart and be proud to push that cart. Um, I am going to stop here because we only have an hour. You want to hear from these two terrific individuals, and it is my pleasure, my pleasure and my honor to introduce them to you. Please come up to the microphone. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Love you. Valerie, do I look like I'm? All right. Excuse me. Technology is, you know, I live in the backyard of Microsoft, but I'm, you know, I'm just going to find my way through here. There we go. Now. Okay. All right, I think I've got it. All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and congratulations on 10 years of your conference, and it's quite an honor to follow the comedy team of Leahy and Leahy. Um, they're wonderful, wonderful people, and they've done a lot for your community and a lot for us nationally. So Ed and Patricia, thank you um, for all the work that you've done and for your friendship and your devotion. And thank you, Dean Deb and Rebecca and Lori, everyone that's been thanked for um, having us here today. Um, I'm going to move quickly through because I know we're short on time and we've got Senator Casey. So I'm going to apologize in advance to our interpreters because though I'm from Seattle, I'm going to use my New York um, pace of speaking. 
So today we're here to talk about our work with business. And if, um, when, when Lene gets here, when Commissioner Rutledge is here, you will hear from her that employment is our responsibility in the Voc Rehab program. And so what we've done at the national level through our membership organization of VR directors, as Patricia said, we have 80 agencies, 25,000 VR staff nationally, and we are a family. Um, I began in VR in 1978, directly out of high school, not really, but um, this is a passion for people who work in this field because we believe so much in the abilities of people and what they contribute to our community. And we believe in partnering. And one of our most important partners is business. Because when we begin in, with the end in mind, where we understand where those employment opportunities are, we do a great job with the individual customers that we work with. We're very focused on employment outcomes. As Patricia knows, we talk about careers, not just a job. We serve over one million people with disabilities a year through our program, and we're partnered with our sister agencies in the Veterans Administration, Voc Rehab and Employment Program, and as you know, we have a number of veterans returning from Afghan and um, Iraq that are a large focus of what we do. Our other partner is the American Indian Rehab Program. Together, our programs make up the largest talent pool of people with disabilities in the country. And we're backed by the support of our VR leadership, our commissioner and RSA, our staff, and 10,000 community partners. I want you to understand how big we are and how that enables us to partner with business. When we asked our business customers, how can we better work with you? They said, look at us as a customer. Ask us what we need. We will help you. We will help you build. We, we talked earlier, and I know that, um, uh, that other companies have toured Lowe's distribution centers here. Um, our, our point of contact here, Dave Baum, was telling Beth, there was another company interested, and in Lowe's welcomed them in and helped show them what they had done in order to make their workplace accessible and welcoming to people with disabilities. They want to be our partner. They said, look at yourselves as being national in scope, because guess what? their national in scope. So when we work together, and Beth will be talking with you about our national agreement, we were just in Charlotte yesterday at the Lowe's corporate headquarters, and Patricia, you would be so jealous. I, I asked for them to send some help to me when I go to Lowe's to make my yard look like that. Yeah. But Beth is going to be talking about that um, a little bit later. But it's really looking at them and the fact that there are two regional distribution centers here in Pennsylvania, but guess what? There's 39 across the country. And if we develop a good model here, why don't we take it to other areas in terms of hiring people with disabilities? So Beth's going to talk about that. She said, they also said, make your network easily accessible. We don't want to have to call 25,000 people or 10,000 community partners to get what we need. Give us a single point of contact which our VR leadership has done. We have 80 points of contact around the country that make up the national employment team. And the remarkable thing about this discussion, and there were 35 businesses there with us, and Beth was one of them. At that point, she worked for South Trust Bank, which was acquired by Wachovia. You don't, ta you don't say takeover. Acquired by Wachovia, acquired by Wells Fargo. Now she's left that industry altogether, which was probably a smart move. She's at Lowe's because she has invested most of her money there in her kitchen and home. So this is probably a good move for her. But, you know, the incredible thing is working with people like Beth so that we can look at how we leverage the strength of our national system to benefit individuals with disabilities, but also to benefit our business customers because it's a win-win when we work in partnership. What they told us, and Beth reinforces this all the time, is the foundation of your network has to be built on trust. Disability is a topic that has not been discussed in our community. In fact, sometimes people stumble because they don't know if it's politically correct to ask a question about disability. So we have got to create a relationship based on trust so that those questions are answered before they become barriers. Be responsive, deliver what you commit to, be consistent in your quality and make your program sustainable. But the bottom line is, it's all about the relationship. Beth knows if she has an issue, she can pick up the phone and call, and we're going to find her the answer and the solution. And guess what? It's probably right here in this room. 
The net is a customer-driven approach. We focus on working with customers, understanding their needs and values, what they're looking for, how we build that relationship for the long term, because we know this isn't just about one job. It's about careers for individuals. And the bottom line is we must deliver what we commit to. Here is the vision statement that we developed when we first launched the net, and it remains the same. We want to create a one-company model to serve business customers through a national VR team that specializes in employer development, business consulting, and corporate relations. That may sound like a different role for VR, but you know, it makes sense. I worked as a counselor in the VR agency in Washington, and the more I understood business, the better job I did with the people I worked with because I knew where their goals were and how they fit with what the business goal was. Benefits. Uh, the bottom line in relationships is what's in it for me, what's in it for the person who is participating in the relationship. We provide business with direct access to qualified candidates and the support services by our agencies and our community partners on a national basis. And you will see, you're going to hear this afternoon workshops that talk about that. VR consumers, our individual customers, have access to career development resources, real-time information from businesses that help them develop careers at a national level. And you know, through our network, we've been seeing people move from one state to another to attain careers. State VR agencies, we have a system for sharing employment resources, best practices, and business connections. And that's basically what the net is. Now, business also helped us to find services. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go into all the details, but it's important to look at how they define what we are doing for them. They're looking at pre-employment services, how we create internships with companies, how we create training programs that are company-based, how we help them recruit and promote people, how we help them retain people. And this is a growing segment of the population. People are working longer, either because they want to or because they have to. And when those people start acquiring disabilities, vision loss, hearing loss, are in accidents, have illnesses, the business wants to keep them working. They want to keep their talent employed. And we've been focusing on businesses who are really looking at how to make that happen. And we talked about that yesterday with the, with the Lowe's team. Accommodations, taking a look at worksite assessment, assistive technology, helping business look at how do you make systems accessible in a universal design. Staff training and development around disability awareness and around the practicality of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Not just what the law is, but how do you make that work, okay? How do you help employers understand how to make it effective for them as well as for the individual with a disability? Diversity programs, businesses asked us for support there because they are seeing disability as part of the diversity movement. And when a business reflects the diversity of their community, that diverse community does business with them. And Beth is going to talk about that and how that impacts all of the people who like to shop at Lowe's. Um, EEOC, affirmative action. The Office of Federal Contract Compliance has increased their monitoring for federal contractors. Anyone who receives $10,000 or more in federal funding is obligated to be affirmative in how they reach out and recruit diverse populations, which include people with disabilities. Uh, Lowe's is a federal contractor. There's a motivation behind companies for continuing to be a federal contractor as well as hiring the talent from our community and we need to understand that and help support that. Universal design, we've worked with programs, uh, Walgreens, um, different companies where we've looked at how you actually design workplaces from the ground up to be universally accessible. Look at how they make computer systems, how they do ordering, how they make things physically accessible. Uh, anything that's visual, is it auditory? Anything that's auditory, is it visual? Do you add pictures to things to make your, your um, print more understandable to people with processing disabilities? So we've looked at large companies, help them create that. Financial supports, the tax credits and the, the tax deductions for barrier removal. The legal and compliance. If you've got an attorney in a company that doesn't understand the ADA, uh, which we've run into, um, then what happens is they create barriers in their policies to actually considering the talents of people with disabilities, and we've worked a lot there. Product development, 
We've worked with companies to help make their products more accessible and to help bring their products to market for people with disabilities. Customer service, marketing, and outreach. If you are a company that wants to reach this population as a customer base, how do you do that? Guess what? The answers are in this room. Okay. Business sees the value of this, and Beth will reinforce this because she helped create it. Um, but we really want you to understand the role that you have in voc rehab and in rehabilitation and the employment of people with disabilities. Now we want to move on and talk about the, the transition population and what the population of people with disabilities looks like um, in the United States and how we impact that. We know there's 54 million people or roughly one out of five people in the United States has a disability. Three out of ten people are born with their disability. Seven out of ten people acquire it after the age of 20. Think about that, how that impacts our business partners. Another interesting fact, and this is um, brand new data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in the population of people without disabilities, 87% are age 16 to 64 and 13% are age 65 or older. For the population of people with disabilities, 55% are age 16 to 64 and 45% are 65 or older. And like I said earlier, many of them are still employed. And the VR system works with transitioning youth, but we've also worked with people in their 70s or 80s who are continuing to work. Okay. Specific conditions. When we look at the populations we're working with, 10.2 million people have difficulty hearing. 6.5 million people have vision difficulties. 13.5 million people ages five and older have difficulty concentrating, remembering, or making decisions. And of that group, 2.1 million are children ages five to 17. When we talk about transition, think about the impact of that. 19.4 million people age five and older have difficulty walking or climbing stairs. Now you'll notice these are not labels. These are the barriers that people face and we know we have the solutions to help them reduce or eliminate these barriers, but we have to open up the discussion. I want to reinforce this, and um, I am at, the, at Scranton, so universities understand this. Education pays. This is another message that we need to share with young people, with parents, with everyone that we work with. The chart that is up on the screen right now talks about unemployment and weekly earnings based on your educational level. Um, people who have less than a high school diploma, their unemployment rate in 2010 was 14.9 percent. People who had a doctoral degree, their unemployment rate was 1.9 percent. All of you who are, who are here investing in your education, you made a great decision. Okay. Your weekly earnings, less than a high school diploma, $444. A professional or doctoral degree, you're looking at 1550 to sixteen to one thousand six hundred and ten dollars a week. So again, the higher your level of education, the less the unemployment, the higher your level of education, the more your weekly earnings. Okay? That applies across the board. How does that apply for people with disabilities? When we look at the employment by educational attainment for people with disabilities, and we're looking at a population of 25 years or older, which is about 18.2% of the overall population. People with disabilities who are employed, 8.5% of them had less than a high school degree, 16.1% had a high school degree, 23.5% had some college, and 30.3% were college graduates. Again, what applies to the general population applies to this population. And I want to say this is one of the reasons why it's so important for us to be in the U.S. Department of Education, because education benefits people with disabilities as well as the general population. Employment data. People without disabilities are employed at 63.5 percent. People with disabilities are only employed at 18.6. Here's our ongoing challenge. For people who are employed, people without disabilities and part-time work are at 20 percent. People with disabilities are at 33 percent in part-time work. And people with disabilities are more likely to be self-employed. So I want you to think about those trends when we're thinking about the way people work and how we plan careers. Now we can make changes in this by 
doing some things that I think we all need to be talking about. And these are the challenges and opportunities. How do we move students with disabilities into careers? How do we open this up? What are the barriers that we're facing? Where do we need to focus? One of the first barriers is the perception and expectation of not only others, but of the individual. For students with disabilities, how many of them have been told, you can't, you can't, you can't? Where do they find the power to say, I can? And what about the expectations of others? What are our expectations of students with disabilities? Where are their role models? Where are their mentors? Are they connected? I've spent time in the schools where I've met young people with disabilities who have never met an adult with a disability. Where do they think they fit if they don't have a vision? They have limited work experience and limited exposure to careers. They have difficulty sometimes with access, accommodations, and transportation, particularly in rural communities. The biggest danger, I think, here that we need to talk about is how people don't make the transition from high school to work. They make the transition from high school to benefits, okay? And they get hooked on Social Security. And what do we know? Less than 1% of everyone on Social Security ever gets off of Social Security. Okay? Am I saying anything new? I am straightforward about this barrier. We have to connect the talent of our young people with the opportunity that we're talking with business. We have to have career expectations for young people with disabilities. We have to engage teachers and parents at a very young age in that child's life to talk about expectations and to connect them with people with disabilities, adults who are working in our community. We have to create that vision for support services and for the individuals. We have to move from a medical model that says you can't, you can't, you can't, to a career and vocational model that says you can, because we have ways to make that happen. We need to introduce parents and teachers to programs that engage young people. And I have a list of them that I'm gonna be talking about. We need to help young people move into the role of self-advocacy. When you think about a young person in high school, in middle school, who's driving the decision? It's the parents. The parents are in the role of the advocate. And I'm really glad that you're gonna have some parent organizations here. But as these young people move into the world after high school, where do they learn how to advocate for themselves? Are we teaching those skills? Are we setting expectation and teaching skills that help make people independent and employed in our community? You know, if we do our jobs, if people do not get stuck in the trap of Social Security uh, benefits and we move them into careers, we know for every dollar that we invest there's a seven dollar return. So it's not just the individuals that benefit, but it's you as taxpayers that benefit. And I think that's always important when we talk about the value of our program. I wanna share with you some initiatives that are supporting transitioning youth. Um, there's a new website, a new development called Our Ability, and it's being developed by a partner of ours, John Robinson, who's an individual with a disability. He has set up a website where he is going around the country and videotaping adults with disabilities who are working in various careers. In November, he'll be with us in Seattle. We're gonna be interviewing four Microsoft employees, one of whom is an engineer. Um, who was assisted by VR in South Dakota and is now working on the access features for Windows 8 and 9. People with disabilities making a difference, getting the role models out there. Early exposure to careers. Microsoft also hosts what's called DigiGirls. DigiGirls is a week-long day camp for young women 13 years and older to help engage young women in professions of IT and computer science. Women with disabilities have been involved in that. They have a vision of themselves, and Microsoft's whole intent is to attract them young and to engage them. And a lot of our company partners want to do that because they're building their workforce for tomorrow. The American Association of People with Disabilities has Disability Mentoring Day, 
how many of us are participating in that with our company partners, getting young people out to the workplace, looking at career fairs, looking at high school high tech, which is a program, a summer program that exposes young people to computers and how to use them and what careers are involved. VR has several transition counselors. We work with the schools. A lot of our programs around the, com around the country have summer work experience. We all know how important that is in shaping careers for people. We're working with companies like Hyatt and Manpower, where we're developing business-based training programs. One, hands-on education, is a total focus on educating people through hands-on instruction. They've been working with a wide range of people, and they've had success in a wide range of populations with people from reading levels of second and third grade to individuals who are blind, individuals who are deaf, people with mobility impairments, people with developmental disabilities. And one of the great things was in their Florida Hyatt, the Grand Hyatt, they have a, a dessert chef. I, I, that's not what you call her, but she's deaf herself. The State School for the Deaf brought their whole class to tour and meet with her and talk with her about her career. Business has opened their doors and they're looking at the talents of young people with disabilities for their workforce tomorrow. Internships, the American Association of Science has entry point. We're looking at working and are working more closely with programs like the Workforce Recruitment and the COSD, which is the college focus on students with disabilities and building work experience. Those are just a few examples of things we're working on. I also know you're doing some exciting things in your community. You've got an arts program. You're exposing people to different careers. And I want to say we have got to ramp that up because we don't want people dependent on Social Security. Now it's my honor to introduce my friend. Remember I talked about building relationships? With your business partners, those relationships can become very personal. And I am so fortunate to have a business partner and a friend in Beth Butler. Um, she's traveled around the country with me, including Bismarck, North Dakota, which I'm still paying her back for. <laughs> <laughs> but Beth has a very inspiring personal story. She has a very strong commitment to what we're doing. She is helping us build this. And I think it's really important for you to hear directly from an individual and from a business partner in terms of what our efforts do and how important they are. I have your logo up, Beth. Oh, that's good. Okay. That's wonderful. Yeah, there it is. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kathy, and uh, good morning. And. Patricia, it is always a joy to see you, and now I really believe that Ed exists because she has talked about him for years, and I've never had the privilege of meeting him. So he is not a figment of your imagination; he is real. He'll be so. in the car at lunch. <laughs> I'll be the one with the flatbed truck. That's right. I know. I know. I. But but you know the interesting thing is you fit right in with the statistics because 80% of the decision making that goes on in our stores is made by. Women, yeah, <laughs> would be women. The men are going, no, they're in their car pulling, you know, pulling them out of the store and so forth, but uh, we love it, we love it, so, and we appreciate your business. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure uh, to be here um, in Scranton, and um, I, I have, have as, as Kathy said, traveled uh, quite a bit, um, and this is a busy time, right, in, in the area of disabilities. Um, but I, I have been a longtime um, friend and, and certainly a uh, partner with uh, vocational rehabilitation um, and, and the work of the NAT, the National Employment Team, um, because I believe in partnerships. I believe in the, um, the value that uh, the vocational rehabilitation professionals bring to the workplace. And um, I know that many of you um, in the community here are, are very much aware of the contribution um, that Lowe's has made through our regional distribution centers um, here and across the country in hiring people with disabilities. Um, but what is very exciting for me now is that um, we, can, we can grow that strategy. Um, I am the Director of Diversity and Inclusion, 
So part of my responsibility is to um, not only grow the strategies within our distribution centers uh, around hiring people with disabilities, uh, but to expand that. And, and quite frankly, we have been hiring people with disabilities for a very long time on our retail side and in our corporate office. Uh, but it's, 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 again, incorporating this idea of diversity to include people with disabilities. And uh, it's just an exciting time uh, at Lowe's and an exciting time um, to, to be a part of this work. Uh, I, I'm always encouraged uh, because you, you, you see the growth and, and to watch the national employment team and this, this dream become a reality is just amazing, uh, where you, you have great uh, partners. We met yesterday with a team um, in, in uh, Mooresville at our corporate office uh, from Statesville and from Salisbury, North Carolina, and business relations representatives and, and um, transition specialists and coordinators that are all coming together to talk about how we can support uh, the, the Lowe's Distribution Center in Statesville. And that's what it's about. It's about partnerships. It's about having a seat at the table for everybody and beginning to, um, to think collaboratively. And that's the exciting part. Um, at Lowe's, you know, our, our diversity program is really grounded on the idea of diversity of thought. And I love that concept because, you know, it, it's, it keeps us as leaders and as employees uh, from, from finding the habitual responses, right, to the same types of, of questions. Um, it leads us to the same solutions that we've always had. And when we slow down, right, and we take time to listen and learn from a diverse population, um, that increases our effectiveness. It gives us more opportunities to find those effective solutions. Um, and quite frankly, it leads to creativity, which is what we're about when it comes to home improvement, right? And, the, and decorating and new ideas. So um, diversity of thought is, is absolutely critical um, to, to our continued success uh, as a company. To share just a bit um, about my, my personal journey um, as, as a person with a disability, um, I, am, I was diagnosed at age four with uh, an underdeveloped optic nerve. So I was, um, and, and they called it hypoplasia for those doctors in the room, that was a real technical name. I don't, I don't know where they found that, but hypoplasia of the optic nerve sim simply means underdeveloped. And um, I was diagnosed at age four, but I think one of the, well, I know the, the real critical point for me um, in terms of my journey um, started the day that I was diagnosed um, by a specialist in Miami, Florida. I grew up in South Florida. And the doctor came in, looked at, at my parents, and they said, to the, they said to both my parents, this is what she has. And she, if her vision gets any worse, she will let you know. She's got 2200 vision in each eye. You take her home and you treat her just like you do your other two daughters or you will make a cripple out of her. And back in 1974, okay, cripple was, you know, probably the best they could do um, in terms of the politically correct term. But he made his point. Uh, my parents took me home back to Naples where um, I att attended public schools. I started in kindergarten, went through 12th grade, attending public schools all along the way. Um, I did have a vocational counselor um, at beginning in third grade, I learned to touch type on a large print typewriter. It's funny, I was in Wyoming last week and was talking to a group of high school students and I had to explain what the typewriter was. <laughs> kind of had this glazed look in their face. I said a typewriter. Yeah, it was, anyway, yeah. So, um, but uh, I, I did learn to, to type on the, the typewriter. And, um, and then later in, I think my junior year, received my first CCTV because as reading started to increase, it was very difficult for me to keep up with the reading. Um, but but it's, those, it's those, you know, individual um, needs that, that I knew that as, I, as, as things began to become more challenging, whether it was the amount of reading that I had, um, that, that VR was going to be there um, to partner with me um, through that journey. I went on to, to college. I graduated up the road here at West Virginia University in Morgantown, go Mountaineers, um, and uh, participated there. Uh, and really had, had some relationship with, uh, with the, um, the disability services program um, 
but, but really, the, I think the benefit for me, again, as an individual, is I knew they were there if I needed them. Okay, I didn't, it, it wasn't something that I, I leaned on, but I knew that if I needed some assistance, I knew where to go to get that. And I think that is what was created, again, by my parents' attitude of, you know what, we've got to trust what that doctor said, and that is, if she gets worse, right, or if she, she's not going to put herself in harm's way. So if something changes, she will be the first to let you know that. And I didn't realize how impactful that was, and quite frankly, how bold and courageous that was on the part of my parents until I um, had a child of my own back in 2001. And um, my son brought this whole new perspective, right, as children do, to, to my world. Um, it's one thing to be an individual with a disability and have your career you know, going in a direction and knowing what you need to do in terms of strategies and, and magnifying glasses and so forth. Well, now you've got this little person, right, as part of your world, looking up at you, mommy, and, and uh, trying to figure out this, this whole idea of, um, of low vision. And um, he, he was amazing because what he taught me was adaptability. Uh, when he was three, and he was, and I had to explain this to the high school kids too in Cheyenne, and that was the videos, you know, the video camera, the, yeah. So he would carry me a video jacket around and say, Mommy, Mommy, can you read this to me? And of course, I couldn't see the back of it, but he'd stop and go, let me get your magnifying glass, right? What is that? That's an accommodation, okay? He, nobody taught him that. That's just part of his world. That's what he knew. If he wanted mommy to read something, she needed to have that big black thing in her hand or she couldn't read it. Um, it's, it's little things like that that just um, inspire me to, to continue um, reaching out and, and helping others to understand that, you know, this is just a journey. That's all this is. And we need, we need each other. We need the support services from the community rehab programs, to, from the vocational specialists, um, to, to the businesses that just continue to have that open dialogue of what we can do to work together. Um, and, and that's what's exciting to see um, the progress that's being made across the country uh, where people are coming together, organizations are coming together to support one another. Um, so as I, as I continue my journey, again, transitioning from from college um, on, into, um, on into graduate school. I went to Cumberland School of Law where I graduated um, with a, a, a legal degree and um, was, was actually prompted to do that. I was in a, in a um, situation where I had a, a decision to make, whether I was gonna go to graduate school or go, go to law school. And um, my dad, who was very supportive of, of both decisions, looked at me um, lovingly and said, sweetheart, I'm very proud of you. You just graduated with a degree in communications and, and um, foreign language, but you need to get a job while you decide what you're going to do, you know? <laughs> and I said, okay, okay. So I was in South Florida at the time and thought, well, I'll just get a job up here at the, the hotel. It happened to be the Ritz-Carlton, but it was in bike riding distance to, to where my dad lived, and I thought, well, I could get myself to and from. And I go in, and I interview for this job, and, uh, you know, I'm a college graduate. You know, the world is at my fingertips, right? And uh, I go in, and part of my, uh, part of my interview um, was, was to just share with them at the end that I did have this vision problem, but that, and I couldn't drive. That was really the only limitation I had. So I verbally said this, and the guy smiles at me, and yeah, okay, okay. And I go home, and I didn't get a call, and I didn't get a call, and I'm thinking, are you kidding me? I mean, I've got a college degree, and I can't serve a margarita in a plastic cup around the, I mean, it was the Ritz Carlton, I know, I know, I get that. But I was thinking, I can do this job. So it prompted me, uh, and actually had a friend of mine who said, um, who was a friend of my, my dad's and, and said, she, you know, she had worked for the airlines and had some relationships and, you know, can I, can I call, let me just call and see what, and I was, you know, the pride was, no, 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 you know, I can certainly get this job on my own. After three days, I said, okay, call, call, find out. And sure enough, it was the reluctance, right? The fear of, geez, I mean, I know she looks fine, but she said she was legally blind, you know? What if she falls in the pool, right? What if she, you know? There were all these what ifs. And uh, 
finally, they, they agreed that it was fine. I started working there, and, um, and, and it was fine. But that was what I needed, right, as an individual to make me think about my next decision, and that was to, to go to law school um, and, and be in a position where um, I, can, I can build that bridge and um, open doors for people that don't look like uh, myself, right? That that have visible disabilities as opposed to non-visible, and uh, so so that was that was what I needed at that point was that obstacle in my way to prompt me to take that next step in in my journey, um, and you know went on and uh, and graduated from law school, and uh, again, VR has always been there, right? Uh, it's it's a lifelong journey. And uh, I, I say as, as a mother and then as, as moving into a, a professional career where you're traveling a little bit more, um, you know, there were certain situations um, that, that I would have to go back and look at assistive technology and say, okay, so this is what I've had so far and this has helped me, but, you know, I've got, I've got a son now, I'm traveling a little bit more, let's talk a little bit about those monocular deals, right, that I've kind of not, um, not considered before now. And um, the point in which I, I really looked and, and considered that most seriously was uh, when my son was about five. And, and for those parents in the room, you'll, you'll you know, appreciate this and understand this. You have these little music programs, right? That the little kid, they get up there and they sing something and it's, well, historically in my world, I would pay the same price to go see, I don't know, Chicago and all these great rock concerts growing up and you go and you sit and you listen and I couldn't see, you know, it could be some band from up the road just playing, so I don't know, but I'm there, right? Uh, I couldn't see what was on the stage. Well, when my five or six year old little boy comes down and says, mommy, mommy, did you see me? And I said, oh yeah, buddy, as I always would kind of figuratively, of course, yeah, I, I saw you. He looked at me and said, no, mama, did you really see me? And I said, you know, okay, that's a gut check, right? I have to step back and I have to call my VR partners again and say, okay, talk to me about this, right? Um, talk, what can I do? Because why? Because I want to fully engage in life, right? It's about employment, absolutely. But it's about being fully engaged in in your communities, right, with your families, with your friends, because we're more than just people with disabilities. We are people, we're moms and we're wives and, and, and husbands and, uh, you know, we have all these different aspects of our lives um, that we, we seek to, to engage in. So that was a real turning point for me. Again, um, I, I continue to stay humbled. Um, this, is, this is an ongoing journey because, uh, um, just when you think you got it all together, right? And you're testifying before Congress and you're doing all this. I'm telling you, you we never stop growing and we never stop learning. And um, the, the opportunity to, to work with partners um, like the National Employment Team is just, um, is something that is, is, is valuable to me. And most importantly, it is valuable to the businesses in our community. And um, I will do everything I can to continue building those bridges. So um, thank you so much for your work um, in this area and uh, look forward to um, enjoying the, the rest of the conference. So thank you. Your, your slide is here, honey. Let me say really quickly, this is something that I wanted to share. And no, I didn't color this on the plane on the way up yesterday. This was shared by uh, Steve Salaji, who was our senior VP um, in distribution, and it was made by a child um, of uh, one of our workers out of Mount Vernon, Texas. Uh, we have family days every year in our distribution centers, so as I said, part of you know, our employee engagement um, opportunities is to include our families um, in these types of things. And she was, the mother was walking through and checking, you know, the, this journal that the son had made in, in school. And she comes across this picture and she said, honey, what is this? And he says, well, mommy, he said, this is, this is a picture of when we went to family day. And, and I want to work at Lowe's because I want to work with people, all kinds of different people. 
And I thought, you know, from a diversity perspective, that is exactly the message that we want to be sending to everyone. So I share that with you to say, you know, it is certainly about diversity and inclusion for our employees, but we never know, right, the eyes and, and the ears that are listening and watching um, what we do every day. So that was the story behind that. <laughs> Thank you. Join me in thanking Beth and Kathy for a wonderful and inspiring journey that we all need to take. And as you look up here and you see Patricia, Kathy, and Beth, and I think this is what Lowe's is, this is what these three women are, we're all family. We're only a heartbeat away. So thank you both very, very much. And I shop at Lowe's all the time. Thanks for being so. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One more hand. Thank you very, very much. Well, it is that time of the day when I have the honor to introduce a personal friend of mine that I have known for the last four years. Uh, Joe Grady is an attorney in Scranton and a 1981 graduate of the University of Scranton, just a few years after Mr. Edward Leahy, I believe. Uh, throughout his professional career, <laughs> he has served as an officer and director at many le uh, legal, charitable, and community organizations, including president of the Lackawanna Bar Association and board member of the St. Joseph Center in Scranton, Pennsylvania. He's also very active with the parents of Down Syndrome of Lackawanna County. Mr. Grady has in the past established various seminars and lectures in Scranton on a variety of education-related issues including presentations on the right to special education in Pennsylvania with the assistance of the Education Law Center. He's a proud founding member of the Steamtown Marathon in Scranton. I can't wait to see how he just uh, did in his recent marathon, established in 1996 that attracts runners from throughout the world and benefits the children and young adults who live in, with disabilities at the St. Joseph Center in Scranton. Since 1996, the race has donated more than 650 million to St. Joseph Center. He cur thousand, sorry, those extra zero there. Sorry about those contacts. He currently resides in Scranton with his wife Anne and son Christian. If you've never been to the St. Joseph Center, it is remarkable. I have to tell you, our, our physical therapy, I, the pool, everything that is done is a blessing to this community and to Northeast PA. And Joe Grady, it's people like you that makes a difference. So would you please come up and you have the honor of introducing Senator Casey. Good morning, everyone. Um, technology's great, provided everybody's ready at the same time, obviously. Um, Senator Casey will be ready probably in about five minutes. They're getting him all set up. He had a couple commitments. As you know, he was supposed to be here, if you look at your program, at the uh, lunch hour to do the video conference. Um, he's running into a lot, of, a lot of conflicts, as anyone you can imagine in Washington would run into but he wanted to make himself available. So this time slot fit his schedule the best at 9.45 this morning. And ironically, it fits our time schedule the best too. So what I'm gonna do instead of sitting up here and singing the University of Scranton alma mater for you, um, I'll just like to stretch your legs for a minute or two. We have some people from his office that are actually here. They're communicating with him and they'll give us the heads up when he's ready to go, okay? So we can take a, I think we have a good couple minutes to be able to stretch our legs or so, okay? Try not, try not to leave the room or go too far away though, thanks. Thank you. 